welcome to this online presentation on allergies and anaphylaxis. In this presentation, we'll be discussing the basics of the immune response, how allergic reactions occur, and what the pathophysiology is, mild to moderate reactions, and then the severe allergic reaction called anaphylaxis or anaphylactic shock. Then finally, the pre-hospital management of anaphylaxis. The body's immune system is responsible for keeping the body healthy and preventing disease from taking hold and developing. The immune system is a complex network of cells, tissues and organs that all work together to protect the body from attacks from foreign substances. The white blood cells of the body, which mainly reside within the bloodstream, within the lymphatic system and can also migrate between the different tissues, are responsible for the primary response team of the immune system. The two most important white blood cells of the defense system are the T lymphocytes and the B lymphocytes. The way that B lymphocytes work at protecting the body is once they come into contact with an invader such as an antigen, they recognize this antigen or this new substance that's within the body. They see it as a threat. And what they do is they produce what's called antibodies. Antibodies are Y-shaped proteins that are able to then identify this antigen when it re-enters into the body and it triggers an immune reaction to destroy them. So there are five different antibodies that the B lymphocytes are responsible for producing. They're called immunoglobin, A, D, E, G, and M. The T lymphocytes or T cells, they work quite differently to the B cells. So the B cells produce antibodies that result in allergic reactions to destroy the antigen. Whereas T cells go directly straight for a one-on-one -on -one attack. So T cells that are traveling through the bloodstream will come into contact with these antigens. They release chemical toxins, which then destroy the antigen. As I've mentioned already, antigens are foreign substances which enter into the body, which are seen to be harmful. Antigens have specific markers on the surface of their membranes, which can identify them as a threat. And any antigen that results in an allergic reaction is called an allergen. Antigens can enter the body via ingestion, injection, inhalation, or absorption. When an antigen enters the body, the immune system creates antibodies and attacks this antigen by trying to either neutralize them or remove them from the body. Immune responses are normally protective, but if it becomes oversensitive, it can be harmful to the person, and then this is called an allergic reaction. Different allergens, so things that can cause an allergic reaction, include substances such as food, and this can include things such as shellfish, nuts, strawberries and kiwis to name a few. Medications can cause quite severe allergic reactions and this can be from substances such as aspirin, antibiotics like penicillin and different types of anesthetic medications. Insects, particularly bees, wasps and fire ants can cause allergic reactions and then people can have mild allergic reactions to animal hair and in particular dogs, cats and horses different pollens and molds and in particular in springtime when there's lots of pollen in the air people suffer quite badly from hay fever and people can have allergies to other materials such as latex. Keep in mind that these substances are not normally harmful to the general population but in some people for unknown reasons these substances have been identified as a threat to the body and the body has become oversensitized to them and cause allergic reaction whenever they come into contact with them. The first steps of somebody developing an allergy is a result of a process called sensitization. We've already discussed this as part of the immune response. So just to recap on that, it's a process in which normally a harmless protein called an antigen, specifically an allergen because it develops an allergy, leads to the production of a specific type of allergy antibody. And that's called an immunoglobin E. 
This antibody or immunoglobin E doesn't just randomly float around in the body's system. It attaches to mast cells, which are found in the body's skin, the gastrointestinal tract, and the respiratory system. Now, these mast cells are mature white blood cells that are responsible for eliciting an allergic reaction. The immunoglobin E's can also attach onto peripheral blood basophils, which are also mature white blood cells. As you can see from the diagram below, that IgE protein is a Y-shaped protein. And here we can see it attached onto the mast cell. These IgE proteins remain on the mast cells and the basophils, awaiting that antigen to re-enter the system. When the allergen enters the body for a second time, it attaches onto the IgE proteins on these sensitized cells. For any further reaction to occur, the allergen needs to attach onto two adjacent proteins, just like it shows on the diagram over here. When this allergen attaches onto the immunoglobin E proteins and causes what's called a cross linkage, this results in the mast cells bursting or going through the process of degranulation, and they release several chemical mediators into the body system which result in an allergic reaction. One of the most commonly known chemical mediators is one that's called histamine. This process can then result either in a mild to moderate reaction or into a severe allergic reaction called an anaphylactic reaction. Here we just have another diagram depicting how the sensitization process occurs and then the triggering of the allergic reaction. So here we have an antigen entering into the system. The white blood cells then produce things such as antibodies, which then attach onto the mast cells and the basophils throughout the body. When this antigen or allergen enters into the body again, or the patient experiences a re-exposure, these antigens will bind onto the antibodies and if there's a cross linkage between two antibodies it causes the mast cell to degranulate or to burst and release all those chemical mediators which then result in either the localized allergic reaction or the full body anaphylactic reaction. Let's first have a look at this mild to moderate reaction. Signs and symptoms that may be present can include things such as rhinitis, a runny nose, itchy eyes, pruritus, which is itching of the skin, utricaria, which is hives, angioedema, swelling, abdominal pain or vomiting. Uh, just to make a note here is if there's abdominal pain or vomiting associated with an insect sting or bite, that's a sign that this is anaphylaxis. Management of mild to moderate reactions. If possible, eliminate the cause. For example, if there's a bee sting in the patient, get a pair of tweezers and remove that bee sting safely. You can apply a cold compress to stings and bites, and oral antihistamines can be very helpful in relieving the signs and symptoms, as well as steroids or topical creams, and these are mainly available through the pharmacy. Mild to moderate reactions have the capability of turning into a severe whole body allergic reaction, which is called an anaphylactic reaction. An anaphylactic reaction has been described as an immediate, systematic, life-threatening allergic reaction. So it usually involves the whole of the body. The chemical mediators that are released from degranulation of mast cells and basophils will help us to understand the pathophysiology of anaphylaxis. Histamine, one of the chemical mediators, results in an increased vascular permeability and vasodilation. So as the blood vessels dilate and get bigger, it gets easier and easier for fluid to move from the intravascular space in the bloodstream out through the vessel walls into the surrounding tissue. And this is what causes the swelling and edema in the tissues and that also results in a decrease in circulating blood volume, so a drop in blood pressure. There's an increase in secretions, secretions from the eyes called lacrimation, secretions from the nose or runny nose called rhinorrhea, an increase in oral secretions and bronchial secretions as well. Histamine can also result in bronchoconstriction from stimulation of the bronchial smooth muscle, and it results in an increased motility of the GIT tract. Leukotrienes, another chemical mediator, are known to be the most potent bronchoconstrictors. 
Leukotrienes also result in an increased vascular permeability, just aiding all that fluid movement out of the vascular space and into the surrounding tissues. Other chemical mediators such as heparin, thromboxanes, prostaglandins and kinins can cause signs and symptoms such as fever and chills, more bronchospasm and some pulmonary vasoconstriction which can make ventilation perfusion inequalities. Now we've had a look at what some of these chemical mediators can do within the body, let's have a look at some of the signs and symptoms we can find on the anaphylactic patient. Due to the changes in the blood pressure, we can find central nervous system effects such as lightheadedness, a loss of consciousness, confusion, headache and anxiety with a decreased level of consciousness. In the respiratory system, patients can experience SOB or shortness of breath, wheezing, indicating that there's constriction of the lower airways or the bronchioles, stridor, which is indicating that there's an upper airway obstruction, hoarseness and voice, also depicting that upper airway obstruction from the swelling, pain and swallowing, and a spasmodic cough. In the gastrointestinal system, cramps in the abdomen, pain, diarrhea, and vomiting. There may be, in extreme cases, a loss of bladder control. Patients may also experience pelvic pain due to the increase in smooth muscle contractions. On the skin, Patients may be showing signs and symptoms of hives, itchiness, and flushing of the skin due to the vasodilation. Heart rates are going to start increasing to compensate for the lack of blood pressure, They're showing signs of symptoms of shock there. And then looking at the face, swelling of the lips, tongue, or throat, a runny nose, and swelling under the conjunctiva in the eyes, and lacrimation. Anaphylaxis is a true medical emergency which leads to severe hypovolemia and shock as well as an irreversible airway obstruction. If these patients do not receive medical treatment rapidly, they can die. It is important to be able to discern between mild to moderate reactions and anaphylactic reactions to ensure the patient gets the appropriate care. Now you may notice some of the signs or symptoms of anaphylaxis are also present in the mild to moderate reaction. So how do we tell when somebody is just having a mild to moderate reaction or they're having a full-blown anaphylactic reaction? What the Australian Society of Immunology and Allergy has put forth as guidelines to discerning between mild to moderate symptoms versus anaphylaxis is that any sign or symptom of a mild to moderate reaction accompanied by any one of the following signs is an anaphylactic reaction. These signs include wheezing or persistent cough, a decreased level of consciousness, swelling of the tongue, difficulty in talking or a hoarse voice, dizziness or syncope, and in children we're looking for the pale or floppy child, and then abdominal pain. And remember, abdominal pain or vomiting only if it's associated with an insect sting or bite. That means that it's anaphylaxis. For a patient who's experiencing an anaphylactic reaction, adrenaline is the first line treatment. Adrenaline has been made available in the form of an auto injector for the first aid management of anaphylactic reactions. Adrenaline works because it stimulates both the alpha and beta subdivisions of the sympathetic nervous system. When adrenaline enters the system, it can cause beta stimulation in the lungs. So it opens up those bronchioles, allowing adequate airflow and ventilation again. It stimulates the alpha receptors, which result in vasoconstriction. So it stops that vascular permeability, reducing the swelling that occurs and also increasing the blood pressure again to an appropriate level. Another effect is that adrenaline reduces the release of chemical mediators from the mast cells, so it actually stops that anaphylactic reaction from continuing further. Now it's important to note here that antihistamines are not going to stop an anaphylactic reaction from occurring. All that antihistamines can do is they can halt some of the histamine action therefore relieving some of the signs and symptoms, but it will never stop the anaphylactic reaction from occurring. Adrenaline is the only treatment that halts anaphylaxis. There are two different types of EpiPen auto-injectors available on the market. One is for adult use, one is for child use. 
The green label is the child use EpiPen and it contains a dose of 0.15 milligrams of adrenaline in it. That makes it appropriate for a child of the ages 1 to 5 years or from the weight range of 10 to 20 kilograms. The adult EpiPen is the yellow EpiPen. This contains 0.3 milligrams of adrenaline in it and is for the use of anybody over the age of 5 years or over the weight range of 20 kilograms. This is quite a safe dosage to use on anybody from 20 kilograms upwards. However, for full grown adults or children above the age of 12 or above 50 kilograms, the optimal dose for them would be 0.5 milligrams of adrenaline. EpiPen has kept its doses slightly lower. This is to ensure that it is safe for a vast majority of people to use. Studies have shown even these smaller doses of adrenaline are completely capable of halting an anaphylactic reaction from occurring further. However, if signs and symptoms continue to develop after administration of one EpiPen, subsequent doses can be administered at five minute intervals. There is no maximum amount of EpiPens that can be administered or maximum doses of adrenaline that can be administered. As long as the patient is still experiencing an anaphylactic reaction, we need to ensure that we are administering the adrenaline at five minute intervals in order to manage the anaphylactic reaction. Because EpiPens are so widely used in the community, it's important that even as paramedics, that we know how to administer the EpiPen. The first thing to do is ensure the person is laying supine during the procedure. Remove the EpiPen from the protective plastic casing. Hold the pen in your hand and make a fist around the pen, ensuring that your thumb is over your fingers. There's a little rhyme that helps us to remember which way the EpiPen should be placed. And that is the blue to the sky, orange to the thigh. So the blue end of the EpiPen should be facing away from the patient and the orange end towards their thigh. Remove the blue safety cap and place the orange end of the EpiPen to the mid lateral thigh. Now there is no need to swing or jab because the EpiPen is a spring loaded coil. Therefore we just need to place it firmly against the mid outer thigh. You'll hear a loud click and you may even feel a recoil. Continue to hold it down for three seconds. This ensures that there's enough time for all of the adrenaline to be injected into the person's leg. Once you remove the EpiPen away from the patient, an orange sheath will cover over the needle so that everybody is protected from any sharps injuries. That EpiPen should be kept and handed over to the emergency services on arrival. It's important that the patient remains supine either on the ground or on a stretcher after the procedure. If possible, elevate the patient's legs so that they're placed in the shock position to ensure that there's adequate circulation to the vital organs. Remember that the patient may require subsequent doses if signs and symptoms of the anaphylactic reaction do not subside within five minutes. Do not allow the patient to get up or to walk as they are at risk of collapse because of the anaphylactic shock. And the Australian guidelines recommend that patients go to hospital for four hours of observations after any anaphylactic reaction. And now we'll go through the pre-hospital management of anaphylaxis without the use of the EpiPen. Always follow your systematic approach of assessing your DRS ABCD. Obtain an ample history and try and identify the cause of the anaphylaxis. If any stings are present, remove them with a pair of tweezers. Provide airway management as necessary. If there are any airway obstructions, call for backup immediately. If necessary, provide ventilation. Administer oxygen therapy at 15 liters per minute via a therapy mask. And as soon as possible, provide adrenaline to halt that anaphylactic reaction from developing any further. In regards to your doses of adrenaline, for the adult patient, we'll first have a look at the intramuscular dosage. Intramuscular dosage of adrenaline in an adult is 0.5 milligrams given every five minutes if there's no improvement or resolve of signs and symptoms. With the IV administration or intraosseous administration of adrenaline for an adult, it's 0.1 milligrams of adrenaline given every minute 
until signs and symptoms are resolved. In regards now to the pediatric doses, intramuscular pediatric dose for adrenaline is 0.01 milligram of adrenaline given every five minutes until signs and symptoms resolve. And for intravenous or intraosseous administration of adrenaline in pediatrics, it's 0.01 milligram, also given every five minutes until signs and symptoms resolve. And just a note here for both adults and for pediatrics, the preferred site for the IM adrenaline is that anterior lateral mid thigh. It's the safest and the most effective place to administer that adrenaline. To combat the hypovolemia and the anaphylactic shock, administer IV therapy with a fluid resuscitation. So this is 20 mils per kg given IV rapidly and reassess the patient afterwards. To aid with the bronchoconstriction, you could administer beta-2 stimulants such as salbutamol via the nebulizer, which can be repeated every five minutes until signs and symptoms resolve. Depending on your organizational protocols, it might be appropriate for you to administer antihistamines and steroids to alleviate some of the signs and symptoms. And depending on the patient's level of consciousness will determine the position. If the patient is unconscious and requires airway management, have the patient supine with legs elevated, so in the shock position. Otherwise, if the patient is still of a good level of consciousness, you can have them in the semi phallus position with legs elevated again. Transport the patient rapidly and monitor them very closely. And just remember that patients are to be monitored in hospital for four hours post-incident before being released. Remember that anaphylaxis is a life-threatening emergency that requires rapid assessment, rapid identification, and rapid treatment. Ensure that you are comfortable with recognizing the signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis and the pre-hospital management of this life-threatening condition. Thus concludes the presentation on allergies and anaphylaxis.